see if we, do we have the mics working here? Can everybody start, everyone can hear the mics and everything? Everything's good? I got a thumbs up in the back room. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So I want to welcome you to this talk. It's uh, Tez Shuffle Handler, Shuffling Data at Scale with Apache Hadoop. Um, I want to introduce myself. I'm Jonathan Eagles, um, graduate of the University of Illinois. Any alumni out there? Also, I'm a software developer on the Hadoop team at Yahoo. In addition, I'm an Apache uh, Hadoop and Tez PMC. And my uh, co-presenter today, uh, her name is Kuhu Shukla, and she has her master's degree in computer science at North Carolina State. She also works with me on the Hadoop team at Yahoo and is also a Tez committer. A brief, about, a brief introduction about our journey with Tez at Yahoo. We're all kind of on journeys, and the journey of Tez at Yahoo is a journey of performance. And everyone that attended the uh, keynote this morning, saw Sumit, show kind of our, our graph going up and to the right, increasing our utilization, okay? And that's part of our performance story. And specifically with Tez, it's not just about mm, speed, but it's about reducing the cost of the applications. It's about taking and making the answers to your queries cost less, less, less CPU, less RAM. So two years ago, we announced our intent to migrate away from MapReduce as our execution engine for both Hive and Pig and towards Tez because of its promise for the performance that Yahoo was looking for. There was a talk called MapReduce's History, and it illustrated the, the completion of the last known blockers. And I don't have time to talk about that now, but if you are interested, we can keep talking. And last year, I, along with uh, Rohini Palaniswamy, stood up here and chronicled our journey of adopting Tez full on, from 0% all the way up to the full extent of what we are going to migrate. And it was, it was full of um, what you'd expect, performance wins, lower latencies. It showed all the promises of Tez realized. Now that journey isn't over, and so today's talk Today's talk is about not performance, but refinement. And this is a refinement talk, the continuing journey of Tez at Yahoo. But in order to get started, I have to give you a level set to show the differences between MapReduce and Tez to, that really highlight the importance of the innovation shown in this talk. So MapReduce, as shown on the left here, is a two-phase processing algorithm. In Yarn uh, jargon, it's an app, an application, a Yarn application. MapReduce is shown within the circles, so each Yarn application is a single circle. And the maps themselves are shown in dark purple, and the reduces are shown in light purple. So maps essentially read the data from the file system uh, in this case, HDFS, they do some processing, maybe some selection, some filtering, some transformation. They write that data to an intermediate data store, uh, which is just local disk. And the reduces, again, in the light purple, read that data, read that intermediate data, and do some further processing aggregations, writing finally to the file system, which in uh, what we're talking about before, HDFS. But it's limited to two phases, map, followed by reduce. And in order to do some complex uh, computations and calculations to answer the queries, you have to get very creative, combining those MapReduce applications and combining them together to get the final result. In this case, you can see it took four YARN applications to produce the query. And the query on the right is Tez. It's the same query. It gives us the same answer to the same question, but in the different framework. And so for Tez, again, maps read from HDFS, they process the data, they write it to an intermediate data store on local disk, and then the reduces reduce that, they aggregate it. But this is where the difference lies, is that the reduces can then further write to more intermediate data all the way down the line. So reduces send to data to 
more reduces all the way down to the final reduce where it writes to HDFS. So you can see that Tez was able to accomplish that same query in a single YARN application. So take a moment to compare the clouds which represent the writing and the reading from HDFS. You can see that in MapReduce, there's more reads and writes from HDFS. And of course, when you look at Tez, there's fewer. And it, those HDFS reads and writes were replaced. They were replaced with local disk writes in a process called shuffling, the movement of data from upstream tasks to downstream tasks. And the, that, that fact, those, the edges between the boxes, that shows the data movement and the shuffling process. But we, are, we can't stop there. We have to go under the microscope to look one level deeper to see one more detail level. So that process of moving the data from the upstream task to the downstream task is shown by this diagram. It, essentially, um, each stage, uh, in this case, the upstream stage we're calling maps, and the downstream stage we're calling reduces in this diagram, is not just a single task, but a, a, a series of tasks. And each one of those produce a single output. And the output file in the middle, in the gray boxes, that's, that's called the intermediate file, the I files. We just call them I files, but they really represent the intermediate data that's happened after the processing in the map stage. So the map produces one partition per reducer. So if you look at the reducers, you can see there's three reducers on the bottom phase. And you can see that the corresponding gray box, that intermediate data file that was produced by the map, also has three boxes. So each map produces one partition for each reduce. And conversely, each reduce uh, fetches each of its inputs from each map. Reduce number one fetches three inputs because there's three maps. And this is done through a yarn service that's part of the MapReduce uh, built in. So it's called an auxiliary service. It's part of the node manager. I don't want to get into too many details, but know that it's a pluggable service that frameworks like MapReduce or Tez or even Spark or others can hook into to provide more auxiliary services, more ways of moving that data or even other types of services. And at Yahoo, these edges that movement of data happens a lot. We've probably moved more data, at least publicly announced, than anyone with Tez. So at the time of this talk, we have run 100 million Tez DAGs, completing 50 billion Tez tasks across 38,000 nodes. And when you run at that scale, you start to see the patterns that no one else can see. And you, you start to draw some conclusions that no one else is able to draw. And you see the good numbers, and it's great. But there are other cases. There, the, I won't call them corner cases, because we have a phrase at Yahoo that says, when you run at scale, there are no corner cases. But in our case, 1% of the jobs showed a slowdown. It wasn't slower than MapReduce, but the customer didn't recognize it. But we mined the data, and we found the slowdown even without the customer knowing. We're talking about a slowdown with fetching. And this is the innovation that this talk brings. This is directly from the Tez UI. It comes bundled directly with the um, Apache Foundation deliverable for Tez. This happens to be uh, a job that was run at Yahoo. And it sh shows, uh, of course, the DAG-based nature of Tez, the intricate processing that could be done. And there's some details up there that aren't too critical. But know that the green dot up at the above, that's the reading from HDFS. And the red box down below, that's writing to HDFS. And all the edges in between, that's where we're moving data through the process of shuffling where we fetch the data from the upstream and bring it to the downstream for further processing. 
But in particular, there's one edge that I need to, again, put under the microscope to zoom into to see what happened. Because one of the sophistications that's present in Tez and not MapReduce was causing an issue here. It was causing some pressure on the legacy MapReduce shuffle handler that we were just talking about. This is an exploded view of two of the connected stages. Again, I'm just going to call them map and reduce, but they have slightly different purposes in this case. And you see that this stage didn't have just, again, a single map, but it had 4,300 maps and produced 4,300 intermediate files based on an estimate, and I repeat, estimate, estimated number of 999 reducers. Because reducers, um, they have an ideal size. Each task is um, configured to have an advertised amount of data that it likes to process. This job advertised and said, I know how to process one gigabyte of data at a time. But the maps don't know how much data they're going to produce. In fact, these 4,300 maps produced only 450 megabytes total. So if you look at the the uh, advertised amount, I only need one task, right? The one task can process one gigabyte. There's only less than a gigabyte up there. So we only need one task to process this data. It kind of produces a problem, though, because if you look at the graph, you can see that that one reducer, if you expand it out, has to reach out to each map 999 times, because that one reducer is impersonating the estimated 999 tasks. So there's not 999, there's one. And when you multiply that out for all the maps, it's reaching out and fetching four million inputs, which is not bad from a data perspective, but when there's four million and there's only 450 megabytes, each partition is only 100 bytes, right? And when you fetch over HTTP and set those connections up, you're getting overwhelmed in the overhead. In fact, this shuffling stage, you can see here, took 20 minutes. And again, if, you're, if you've ever been on any slow internet connection, that's a terrible, terrible speed, right? We're talking like 100, 100K. So, but you and I can both kind of see a pattern. You say, what if we could do something better? What if we could not reach out to each map 999 times? What if we could get all the data we need from each input just once? And that's exactly the innovation we thought of, too. So what if we could do a ranged fetch? If I fetch not just piece one, but piece two also, all the way up to all 999 pieces, all in one go. So we introduced a new shuffle handler, the Tez shuffle handler, that has an advanced feature set. And the, the innovation there is simply this. Don't just fetch one piece at a time, but fetch a range of pieces. Get all the pieces in once. And when you look at our new graph, you can see that the connections between the reduces, there's that one reduce, and its upstream map tasks, there's just one per map. In this case, 4,300 connections can be done very quickly. No longer 20 minutes, but 60 seconds, which is a 20 times speed up. This customer became very happy. And we applied this pattern not to just this job, but we rolled it out across other jobs because we mined the data and we found the other customers that were showing these high number of inputs to fetch, also with this feature of auto reduction. And it's not just corner cases we're talking about, but at Yahoo, 1% of all the test jobs have more than 2 million inputs to fetch, which doesn't sound maybe like a lot, right? But when you're running 200,000 test jobs a day, 1% is enough to give me a headache because I support those jobs. And when customers are happy with slow jobs, they're unhappy with slow jobs, it makes, um, I guess, conversely, if I can make them happier with faster jobs, we all get happier. We can make a better Yahoo. So we applied this pattern to other jobs. And I thought, this one is interesting because it's so simple. This is, a, this is Tez running a classic MapReduce job. And surely we can apply this here and it should see the same type of results. 
again, the feature that's interesting is the, the connection piece between the, the two blue boxes is auto-reduced. The upstream produced very little amount of data, right? And the downstream had to right-size itself to, to adjust. Let's see the numbers. So in particular, there's 17,000 maps, and they produced just 128 megabytes total. Our reducers had an estimated ideal size of, again, one gigabyte, meaning we only need one task again. But the maps produced 17 million partitions across 128 megabytes. We thought this is the same pattern, we should see the same speed up, but we didn't. In fact, this is 50 minutes here, but when we apply the test shuffle handler, it didn't drop dramatically, it dropped to 20 minutes. Something else was going on here. We reduced the number of fetches from you know, 17 million down to 17,000, know, three orders of magnitude less, and we reduced all the overhead associated with that. But it wasn't the shuffling that was causing this, the slowdown, it was the next step. It's called merging. So merging, um, when you shuffle the data, right, so it's a, uh, you get all these different pieces. So you have 17,000, sorry, 17 million pieces, right? But they're not in order. And you need to see an order, you need to be able to see a unified view for those. So merging is basically simplified down. It's a unified view of all the inputs that you fetch. This one took 20 minutes, but I wasn't sure what the, the I guess the complexity of the algorithm looked like, so I plotted it out. This is the merge overhead times, in, uh, in purple you can see that's TES 07, that's the standard release for TES at Yahoo. Um, it's also similar to, if anyone's using HTTP, uh, that comes in the, the um, 0 0.8 version of TES 2. The, there's no difference, at least with the merge times there. But you can see, once the numbers start getting large, the times, merge times and the merge overhead times, which is the time you use to um, calculate progress and estimated number of bytes. Not, not too interesting, but it's, you're getting overwhelmed there. It's because when, you, when you're under 100,000, you're less than a second. Under 100,000, you're less than a second. But when you're at a million, you're at 100 seconds. And when you're at 2 million, you're at 500 seconds. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was a, we looked at the code. It was a small Javaism that was never exposed by MapReduce, never exposed because you can't have 17 million inputs in MapReduce. Yahoo runs some of the largest jobs, and the largest one I ever saw had 300 map tasks, 300,000 map tasks, right? And there's no auto reduction. So each one of those reduced tasks had 300,000. That's as many as you could ever see. You would never see on that curve, you're still stuck under 10 seconds. It, it wouldn't show up in the numbers. But when you apply that to 17 million, you can immediately see that we get stuck for hours on this job, hours. Or sorry, with the, the 17 million. So we did a quick Java fix. It's a Javaism. I don't wanna get, if you're not a coder, it's not such a big, big idea, but we used the wrong collection, doing the wrong uh, non-performant operation on it. There was also a small tweak to the algorithm that if you wanna to talk to me afterwards, we can, we can really discuss, because I know some people really like algorithms, but this isn't the right venue for that talk. But when I applied the new algorithm and integrated that into the Tez shuffle handler and the 09 version of Tez, we had some new results. So let's go back and revisit our job. This is what we're looking for. So you can see now we've dropped from an initial time of 50 minutes of shuffling which includes the shuffle time plus the merge time, down to 20 minutes, but with this further optimization, now only 90 seconds, which is 33%, 33 times faster than the original. So when you take those 1% of jobs in, in Yahoo and you add them up, this is a whole lot of cost reduction. This is a whole lot of happy customers. It allows us to run more queries on the same amount of hardware for free and answer more questions. 
So kind of in the, the end of the summary for the first part of this talk before we move on to the second part, Yahoo has shuffled a lot. We've done a lot of Tez and we've gained some experience and we're passing that on to you guys. Um, we contribute all this code to the open source. It's committed. It's going to be in the next version of Tez, which is 0 0.9. So if you're um, curious, you're going to want to start asking for this in your HTTP uh, releases, right? The 0 0.9 is it's going to be coming out soon once it's gone through all the regressions of your um, customers. And for certain jobs, it can see huge benefits. I, I highly encourage you I, to try this out for yourself to see if you see these same patterns in your jobs. So with that, my final takeaway is that the sophistications in Tez, they certainly have outgrown their legacy counterparts in MapReduce. With that, I want to welcome up Kuhu Shukla for the second part of the talk. <clears throat> Thanks, John. Let us look at a different problem that the new shuffle handler addresses, which is poor reserve space utilization. In this part of the talk, we will understand what DAG delete means. Is it as radical as it sounds? Um, what use cases benefit from this feature and why we even need it? Before we dive into the details of space utilization and the new shuffle handler, there are a few test components that I would like to elaborate on. This will allow us to better appreciate the scope of the problem. <coughs> so what is a test session? Apache Tez offers session mode that allows us to run multiple jobs or DAGs as part of the same application. One Tez AM is responsible for initializing and managing multiple DAGs. Uh, the most common example of that would be interactive Hive queries. Typically, a Hive uh, application will load one or more data sets, run multiple transactions on it, that can easily translate to separate DAGs. The figure on the right here shows a logical view of a test session, and you can see that there's only one AM and DAGs run one after the other. The second thing I want to talk about is what is container reuse. In the MapReduce world, a container is tied to only one task attempt. Once the, container, uh, once the task attempt finishes, the container is torn down. So you can roughly say that the lifetime of the container and the task attempt coincide. This is not the case with Tez. A YARN container in Tez can be reused to run multiple task attempts one after the other. And the biggest win, why do we need it? So the biggest win is in the fact that we initialize the container only once instead of doing it for every task attempt. And this cost typically includes the time to get the allocation from the resource manager and the time to localize any required files and resources. Uh, in the figure on the right, you can see I color coded the task attempts differently to show that uh, the sharing task attempts can belong to the same DAG the same vertex, different DAGs or different vertices. So here, they belong to different DAGs of the same session. With the notion of container reuse and sessions, we arrive at our problem. Simply put, DAGs in a session do not clean up after themselves. While the final output data of a DAG might be a dependency or even a requirement for the next DAG that's about to run, the intermediate data is basically dead weight once the pertinent DAG or the DAG that actually generated it finishes. If a session has several DAGs that are shuffle intensive, this can lead to a significant wastage uh, and leading to like a high disk footprint with absolutely no value after a certain point in time. The figure here shows how DAG 1's shuffle data lingers till the end of DAG 4 even though its usefulness ended early on in the session. The same holds true for DAG2 and so on. I would like to hammer this point a little more. This wasteful behavior of DAGs can potentially cause something I like to call session bloating. In a long running shuffle intensive session, the dead weight of the intermediate output starts dominating the disk, 
leaving less and less for other applications and task attempts running or unlucky to be running on the same node. In multi-tenant clusters like the ones at Yahoo, and I'm sure a lot of people run in multi-tenant mode, this can lead uh, for the jobs to, uh, this can affect job efficiency, latency, and even SLAs. It can be argued though, that for a single test session, the wastage is not a whole lot. But as John mentioned, we run about 100 million test DAGs. So just the scale of it exacerbates the impact of this simple wastage. The solution is simple. Delete the intermediate data at the DAG level. We call this ability for the DAG to clean up after itself as DAG delete. It's not as radical, right? It's not like it's deleting something unique. It's just deleting its intermediate output. The trickier question, however, is how do we implement it? And the new test shuffle ha handler has a fix for it. Typically, the intermediate data output directory is stored under, under the application cache directory. I think people who know a little bit about shuffle know what I'm talking about. But basically, it's a directory that has, um, so if you want to figure out what DAG does this directory or this intermediate data belongs to, you have to look at the name of the directory on the node. And the name consists of application ID, DAG ID, vertex ID, task ID, task attempt ID. That's five different numbers. So you have to know which one of those numbers is the DAG number. That, is the, that was the existing design. So before we even get to the deletion aspect of it, we need to, able, we need to recognize what is belonging to a certain DAG. That sounds tedious, right? So now, as part of the new design, the tasks write to their DAG-specific directories under the app cache directory, or you just call it the base directory. Not only the tasks, now the shuffle handler, on the other hand, has to know that, okay, I have a request, but which DAG does it belong to in the first place? So both the tasks and the shuffle handler have to know their DAG number. The new shuffle handlers, uh, like this is one of the requests that are passed to the shuffle handler, and you can see that the DAG number is passed uh, as part of that. Once we had this kind of unique association between DAGs and outputs, the shuffle handler should be able to receive and process the deletion requests on those DAG-specific directories. Again, because they are per DAG, they can now be deleted through a single file system command. The client side in this case, uh, if you look at the figure, is everything but the shuffle handler, or to generalize the container launchers is the client side. The server side is the shuffle handler running on every node manager as an auxiliary service. Once the container launchers are launching container, like they're, they're about to launch a container, they know which node they're going to end up on, right? And they also know the shuffle port for that node through the container launch context. This information is updated for the deletion trackers for every launch. Once the DAG finishes, as you can see in the diagram, it tells the TES AM, hey, I'm done. And the TES app master then tells the container launchers that now this shuffle data can be deleted. The deletion trackers, which now have a session-wide view of what the node IDs are and what their respective shuffle ports are, formulates the HTTP request that is sent to the server side. An example is shown on the left here, and you can clearly see that I've highlighted the DAG action set to delete. We'll talk a little more about that in our future work as well. But this is new, this is our deletion request. Once the shuffle handler receives it, all it does is issues one uh, local file deletion command, because now we have DAG specific directories. This is done for all configured locations on the node manager, so you don't have to worry about where exactly on which disk is your intermediate data sitting. Let's zoom into the deletion trackers a little bit. What should they look like? Container launchers and task executors, specifically in Apache Test 0.9, are pluggable, and should therefore be able to pick and implement their own version of the deletion policy. A default implementation, however, is available to them through an extensible abstract API that can be customized and tied to an existing container launcher or a new one that you're going to add sometime soon. Some containers may not even want one, right? And we should allow that. This 
design of simple opt-in, opt-out, customizable policy allows and paves the way for interoperability with other services like LLAP. And it also allows other kinds of deletion requests, other kinds of requests even, like the one that I showed you with DAG action set to delete, I'm sure you're thinking of a new one to put uh, in the new shuffle handler. So it allows that without breaking backwards compatibility because it matters. I hope at this point we know what DAG delete means and how it works at a high level. And it's time to look at some of the evaluations. There's some math coming now. Okay. So how do we evaluate the efficacy of DAG deletion by the shuffle handler? The benefit of removing shuffle data, let's pay attention here, depends on two key factors. The amount of shuffle bytes and the amount of idle time for those shuffle bytes. This waste can be expressed, the waste of space, the waste of reserve space, can be expressed as the product of number of shuffle bytes for a given DAG, which is available to us through a counter, and the time that, it, uh, that the DAG which generated the data, uh, the time that it ran for, and all the following DAG times in the session. That's what you see in the denominator. That's why the double summation. And you can see that J goes from I to N for every ith DAG. This is bad. We know this is not what we want. The numerator, however, is a simple summation of, you know, the product. So it's basically you're comparing volumes. It's like I had one, I was wasting one bucket of water, now I'm wasting half of that. N here is the number of DAGs, SI the shuffle bytes for the IS DAG, and TI the runtime of the DAG. Let's look at some real jobs that ran at Yahoo. Like all results, let's start with the best case scenario. This use case shows a test session with three DAGs, all being shuffle intensive. The graph on the right plots the amount of shuffle data in GBs at a given time in the session. Note, I mean, I, I hope some, I think somebody's already noticed this. It doesn't show the exact time of shuffle data generation and assumes that this reserve space was required from the onset. This is a fair assumption because at the granularity of when MAP started generating that data and reduces started consuming that data, the results remain unchanged. The pink line is the old one, and the blue line is the new shuffle handler. And as you can see, the area of the blue graph is half that of the pink graph. And if you look at our amazing metric that we came up with, which is the percent savings of shuffle byte seconds, or the volume, we see the savings are 54%. And that's because we ran multiple DAGs that were shuffle intensive, and their run times were comparable as well. That's a lot. Even when you have two shuffle intensive DAGs, you can get very reasonable savings of 33%, where you can see here that DAG2 ended up using the space that DAG1 freed up. This is an interesting case where the session had nine DAGs, with just one DAG that was somewhat shuffle intensive. One might expect that DAG del deletion should not make much of a difference here, but it, were, but it was surprising to see that because the DAG started midway through the session somewhere, the waste it left for the remaining, remainder of it was substantial. So when we moved to the new shuffle handler, the savings were good. They were reasonable of around 26%. As one size never fits all. This is a case where we had a session of three DAGs with the shuffle intensive DAG being the last one in the session. So what happened was that the session teardown request and the deletion requests overlap, so you don't get any wins here. I hope at this point, through these four use cases, it's clear that we get consistent benefit from DAG delete in session mode. We started this journey with Apache Tess about two years ago, with successful migration of MR jobs to Tess at Yahoo, leading to several performance and utilization improvements to look at. And the test shuffle handler is a simple byproduct of that shared need, even in the community, to achieve faster and better results and processing. It tackles major aspects, an improved messaging strategy that is in semantic synchrony with TES's capabilities, like auto-parallel reduction, 
And it also brought the knowledge of DAG and uh, input-output use cases for DAG to the shuffle handler. John showed us some truly uh, gripping use cases where the shuffle handler wins, uh, where the shuffle time wins were several orders of magnitude. Imagine 50 minutes to 90 seconds. The DAG delete feature allows users to escape the unforeseeable and sometimes unavoidable space crunch on a multi-tenant cluster. This is merely the beginning of the shuffle handler, and there is a lot more that it aspires to solve, and we'll, we will cover that real quick. Uh, moving on, so vertex deletion, I'm sure some of you have thought it already. If we can delete intermediate data at DAG level, why not extend that concept at vertex level? or the map and reducer level. Of course, we need to find a way to identify which vertices that have completed have stale intermediate output. Th this will also address the worst case evaluation we saw as part of the DAG delete uh, results. We cannot, however, just take a completed vertex and delete the immediate parent's output, right? But a heuristic that's depth-based, that hey, at depth x, Let's look at all the completed vertices and figure out that if I delete their data, is it a, is it a good heuristic? So this is part of an ongoing JIRA. It's uh, the JIRA numbers out there. And the next one is to do with the unordered case. So unordered case is when you don't want your output to be sorted. A typical example would be the union operation, right? But the way key value pairs are spilled today is just exactly the way it is in the ordered case. So when you're trying to do the final merge, it can show significant, there's a bottleneck there because you make several compression and decompression calls to the codec. And I'm sure like the most generic use case does use a codec. The JIRA number here, uh, the multi-file or the no buffer solution addresses exactly that. And the considerations include here not allowing an excessive number of output files to show on the node because it will make the node run out of inodes. The next piece is not exactly test shuffle handler related, but related to performance and utilization, where uh, vertices that have one HDFS input and other and a combination of shuffle input edges holds on to container, like starts off the container too early. It doesn't respect slow start if we know what that means. And the next one is in the ordered writers, they still, what happens is if for, if for a partition we don't have any key value pairs to process, we still write the entries for it. That's a waste, and it can lead to some shuffle time overhead because it fetches them and then just throws them away. So this JIRA will track that. With that, I, it brings us to the end of the talk, and if you want to look at performance and utilization improvements at Yahoo with, from the perspective of Apache Pig, then do attend tomorrow's talk by Rohini on, uh, let's say, what's the name? It's moving beyond running 100% of Apache Pig jobs on Apache Test. With that, it brings us to the end of the presentation and Q&A. So, in terms of that delete, when do you run with speculative execution on? Yeah. And so do you consider you know, deleting on the slow tasks once you determine there's a faster machine to do it? That's right. So right now, the delete piece only understands DAG. So speculative execution or not, it doesn't make a difference because by the time that the DAG has finished, every speculative attempt or every non-speculative attempt has already finished. You're done with that data. You've got your results from that DAG. So the delete, so that's why the, uh, DAG delete is much easier to understand than vertex level deletion because then you have to make sure that, hey, what do I, what, what do, I do if I have retroactive failures, right? Then you have to regenerate all that data. So what's the impact of that? So that's a more trickier question, like question to answer, but DAG delete only cares about the state of the DAG. So you can turn on speculation or not, and you can still use it. Any more questions? What would be the approach for your part of the talk? Um, so you look at the really slow job, right? So you start drilling into it. Can you just walk through a process, like what goes into you know mining this data and figuring out the you know, first stage where you got the 20% bump and then uh, 20 times bump and then the second stage. Like, can you talk through your experience? Oh, wow. Um, yes, I'd be happy to do that. So 
the, just to repeat the question, just can we walk through the experience of like finding and analyzing these slow jobs? Like how do you get there and how did you find the fix? So um, one thing you should be aware of is that at Yahoo, each job that's finished has a, a number of counters and metrics associated with that job. So all of that, all of that metadata is stored. Um, specifically, it's stored in this like timeline server format. Uh, we're using like timeline server 1.5 that data is then further ingested into a Yahoo specific piece. It's called Starling. Uh, Starling has all the metrics. That's, uh, it's like a relational table that's in Hive, and it allows us to, you know, okay, this is the DAG level data, uh, counters at the DAG level, like which include shuffle time, merge time, number of inputs. We can also uh, deduce like the auto reduce parallelism. So, the way to find that is that when you have all the DAG data and the task data and the stage data, right, the vertex data, you can um, find correlations and say, okay, well, jobs that are this size with this many inputs shuffle at this rate, right? You say, what's the uh, download rate, essentially, right? So you can compare it across uh, other jobs that are in that same ballpark. So when you, when you bucketize them, you say, okay, well, you know, these ones are in that normal part of the curves, but then there's the outliers, the ones that are out of place, right? Especially the ones that are really on the slow side. So that's a way for us to, I wouldn't say predict, but find the, the slownesses that are already present. And I would suggest something like this, because users that, if, if you're waiting for the user to tell you it's slow, it's kind of, um, it's, the, it's the wrong direction, right? It's like, you can find and predict the problems before they happen and fix them. As far as like the how to go about finding a solution to the problem, um, I mean, for for this talk, we had an answer, but there might other be there might be other times where you, you look at the problem and you say, well, I don't know what the answer is, and maybe you look at the problem and you say, I can fix it, but it's not always the case. Sometimes you say we'll put that off or we'll have someone else in the community. And that, really that's the, the benefit of open source community is that Yahoo isn't contributing 100% of the TES code, right? We might be running some of the largest TES jobs and pushing it to the limits for scale. That's kind of the Yahoo thing is, you know, how can we take this and run it at like massive, massive scale? So that's, that's kind of what we're seeing. But then, um, I, I, yeah, I guess my point there is that we're not doing all the contributions. We're reaping so many benefits from the community. I mean, there's other you know, people right here in this room that have put way more contributions in than, than Kuhu and I together. I mean, it's just, um, so, so I guess my, my point there is just, it's kind of, you have to, to judge it and you have to, to guide that. You have to see, you know, is this the time that you know, Yahoo's gonna make this contribution? or not, and, and usually the contributions Yahoo makes is based on our expertise, which is scale. It's also based on security, that's kind of our thing also. So usually if it's in those two areas, that's, that's oftentimes our, our niche. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one others? Uh, good question. So the like the there's a couple of things going on here, but uh, specifically you mentioned like I think you're wondering just just to make sure everyone knows. So there's like a if you like this talk, there is a way to review it in the app and, and give some feedback on that. We'd really appreciate that, especially the conference would like that as well. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention that is going to be lunch soon, so we'd be happy to keep answering questions. Um, getting back to your question, so. Uh, does this work with 2.6? So I think the I think it's not. That's zero nine is not one We we don't I don't believe it actually works in that case. And and the specific thing is 
is it auxiliary services aren't? Uh, I have to I have to look that up for you. Yeah, so Good question. Um, so, yep, good question. So, one thing, so Yahoo is running, rolling out this test shuffle handler with the 2.8 version of the cluster. So it's a, kind of an early version of 2.8 with some, you know, add-ons. Um, but as far as the LLAP part, so LLAP is, is Tez execution engine, right, the, the engine part of that, the scheduler um, and some of the other DAG components, but the, the LLAP piece, which there's some experts in the back of the room that really would be able to help you there, but it, it's kind of the plugins that sit on the outside, right? It's like you took the engine and you took it out of Yarn and you replaced some of the, those pieces with the LLAP, right? The long live and process pieces, right? So you're, you're no longer, you know, requesting resources from the resource manager. You're, you know, you have those through this LLAP service and uh, so this optimization, this Tez shuffle handler is orthogonal to that. So LLAP has its own shuffle service. Um, I guess we could probably defer to some of the, I don't know if they have like a DAG delete capabilities at this know. point. I don't know. Well, it uh, could easily be done, yeah. yeah. This is all uh, in cache memory. That's, that's what uh, gave me the performance. Uh, you know, versus, uh, Sure, yeah. sure. Um, I think that's, yeah. Anything else? I mean, did we get that clear enough? If we want, we could probably bring that offline and kind of really yeah, dig I just, in. I uh, wanted to see, you know, like, you know, again, you know, how, you know, on your future, uh, you know, releases, uh, I mean, are you, like, the way you compare with memory is, uh, are you uh, considering uh, LLAP performance uh, versus TES? You know, just, just uh -huh. curious. So I'm not sure about the performance, but in terms of the design, we do want our shuffle handler to be able to speak LLAP, if you know what I mean. Like, at least from the design aspect, we've had some discussions on the JIRAs that, I, uh, that we had on the presentation as well, where we tried to uh, make it so that it, it understands LLAP and it can work with the shuffle handler. I mean, this is future work, again. This is a yeah, thought, but it's, um, it's, it is, it is headed in that direction, but not quite no, yet. Okay. All right, if there's no other questions, otherwise we'd like to take them outside. So yeah. thank you again, thank everyone. You. Yeah.